What happens when a helping hand meets a hacksaw? I'm Rugburn. And I'm Pickled Landon. And this is Tombstone Tourist. So, we're just going to hop right into it, kind of, we're going to build some character profiles, get to know everyone involved in our little story, yeah. First off, we're going to go ahead, we're going to break down Lauren, because this is her story, ultimately. So, Lauren, she was, like, described as very kind, outgoing, sociable, you know, just someone people want to be around, intelligent. She was going to Mercer Law School. Did she have a boyfriend? She did. She had a boyfriend. They were, you know, in talks of marriage. And he wasn't in state, right? No, they were long distance. She had been living alone for three years, actually. So she was completely alone, working on herself, getting her law degree. Super. Just to show you how, how, you know, how good of a person she was. She was one of the huge things that she was against was the death penalty. As a lawyer? Yeah, a lawyer. She she didn't want the death penalty to be on the table really for anyone. She just she just didn't like the the idea of it for some reason, which kind of shows you the kindness in her heart that she didn't want even criminals to be She inherently believed everybody had a right to life. You correct. Might say. Yeah. So she she really was kind of an outlier, just very big heart, sociable person, like just very nice. Head of clubs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe the Federalist Club. I'm mm-hmm. not too familiar with what that is. I believe it has something to do with the social or the justice system. Yeah. And, and unfortunately that might have been part of her demise, just being entirely too kind and willing to help anybody. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk about the other side of the story. Steven. Steven. So almost a stark difference, right? Steven, long Coheed and Cambria hair. But skinny, not like Claudio. Yeah, skinny, weird. Uh, there were accounts of him wearing chain melt to school at one point. Being really smelly. An ex-roommate did refer to him as lack of basic hygiene. Just a little cut. Uh, if we look at this picture right here. It's very noticeable that Steven doesn't take care of himself. He has poor dental health, um, seems to be greasy, stringy, unkept hair. Not like Claudio from Coheed and Cambria. He has very, very nice hair. Don't want him to think anything bad if he heard this. <laughs> so, yeah, Steven just, he's hes not really somebody you want to be around, man. He's just... It's school shooter vibes, kind of. You and know, just he, he weird. came from a Christian upbringing too. That's and, correct, a very strict one. And if he's, I'm not he's an alone person. Mm-hmm. He's he's so alone that it seems that at some point in his life he became okay with that being the rest of his life. I think he was pushing people away even because I believe it's the same ex roommate. It could be wrong. It could be a different roommate, but I can't imagine this guy having more than one roommate, having looked out twice like that. Who knows? But even. His ex roommate was saying things that he would almost on the daily talk about how he thinks he could get away with murder and what he would do if if he did kill someone and things like that. But that in itself is troubling to yeah. say the least. Like, how would you feel if you came home and like you had a roommate and they were just saying stuff? Well, like you? Yeah. It, like, Michael, I could kill you at any given moment mm-hmm. and get away with it. I would be concerned to say the least. And if you were smelling real bad and wearing chain mail everywhere, <laughs> Man, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I would go ahead and get with the university if this was some type of housing, and I would I would definitely petition to have Stephen not be living with me. A hundred percent. So you, you kind of get an i an idea. And he's very into fantasy. I want to get a little bit deeper. He's into fantasy. He's writing his own fantasy fiction. He's real deep in the internet and forums. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's a nine eleven nut too, right? Nine eleven nut. Um, Stephen was probably about. This is two thousand eleven. I don't know if we mentioned that earlier. This is 2011, so Steven was probably 16, I believe, they mentioned when 9-11 happened. Mm-hmm. And he, he keeps a stash pile of, I believe, water, food, weapons, just to kind of, in case, he, he was pretty positive that the United States was going to be hit with another attack. At least in his head. Yeah, so you can kind of get an idea of overall who Steven was as a person and just kind of how he might be like to be around well lauren as i said earlier very kind very sociable willing to help always putting a hand out unfortunately 
she put her hand out to Steven, right? And she's encouraging him to be more sociable. Come on, Steven, come to this, do that, you know? And it's at this point, I think Steven... He thinks she likes him. I think so. I think he has such little social interaction with people that he's misreading her kindness and just general concern for him as romantic gestures is what I think happened. And it, and it might be proximity. They're neighbors, correct? Correct. They he live He's above. living directly above her, too. So that could have something to do with it as well. That's That might be like the closest he's been to a and female. And they went to school together. And they, they would see each other at school. This isn't just a passing acquaintance. They're probably around each other quite a bit. Um, she sees him at school. They graduate the same year. She, I think she encouraged him to go to a party at one point. And even then, there's descriptions of him spending the entire time completely alone. Playing darts, right? In the back. Yeah, playing darts. It's all by himself. And that's kind of weird because you would think if you're at a party, what better place? I mean... Alcohol is the ultimate like anxiety killer almost like for social situations and things of that nature. Especially in college. Yeah. I would agree in college. That's the best time to to go out and meet people. Yeah. To go ahead and exp expand yourself socially and, and kind of just see, see, see the world. Yeah. See the world and socialize, meet new people and things like that. And she would encourage him that. I believe he was part of the Federalist group that we mentioned earlier that she was the president of. He ended up being... I don't know if it's the vice president, but like co co president, co head mm -hmm. of the Federalist Club under her, under kind of like her, you know, go get them, Stephen. Don't let people hold you down. Yeah. Get out there, see the sun. You don't have to be alone. I'm here. I'm your friend, Stephen. I think Stephen just ultimately just couldn't handle having something of. A female being that kind to him. Did he ask her out? He did. He, I believe it was multiple times, at least once. And she did turn him down. But I can imagine by the type of way that Lauren was described that she let him down nicely, I can imagine. Now, this is conjecture, right? I obviously wasn't there. No one was there besides Lauren and Steven. So who knows? But I can only imagine that she let him down very softly on some... I don't want to hurt his feelings because of how nice she was. Well, even a person that's not nice would probably, given the proximity, and this is, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of kind of bring in that her friends would tell her to be concerned about Steven, given his behavior, just descriptions of him. Even her uncle did say that he was kind of just a creep weirdo. So that means that she had at least been talking to people that he was given weird, creepy yeah. vibes. And kind if of. somebody like that, if they catch you alone on the staircase at your apartment, it, it would kind of behoove you to... You don't know what they're capable of, so anybody's going to, hey, no, you know, I don't have the time. I, I, I appreciate it. That's how I would be if I was in Lauren's And she had an easy out. She could, she could simply just say, I have a boyfriend. I have, I have a boyfriend, yeah. And, and that you can't really be, a, or you shouldn't be offended at that, right? Speaking of the boyfriend, she was sending emails to him, right? She was. She had been getting this feeling that things had been getting moved around her apartment, missing, just off like a weird gut feeling yeah just unsettled and this letter to get a door jammer because she was convinced at this point right she's 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 not thinking she's paranoid at this point like oh maybe i just misplaced this or maybe whatever no she's that door concerned jammer, that door jammer comes into into play a lot later that she's mm -hmm. and i think we've all had that feeling where we know that something's not right it's usually it usually explains itself um you left the stove on or the cat moved something. Mm -hmm. or, um, but we don't generally disregard that feeling. Right. And I think Lauren was having a hard time disregarding that. But I think coupled, I believe she was going to move pretty soon. This mm -hmm. might have been one of the factors. I think she was willing to let it go temporarily because the move was so close. She only had a few more days, I believe, or at the end of the month before she was going to get out of there. Mm -hmm. That was going to kind of all go away for her. And the last we would hear from her is June 25th. So the end of the month was, it was literally the end of month, mm -hmm. you know? So she had almost no time left on that. So speaking of which, the last thing anyone heard from her was June 25th. After they graduated. Mm -hmm. So about a month after. And the, she had mentioned that she was studying for the bar exam and that... You know, she might be a little less social during this time to give her some space. That's how social she is. She has to actually reach out to her friends and family and say, hey, my social battery is completely dedicated to getting this bar done. Mm -hmm. That also shows her dedication to what she believed in, the, 
to get out there and start practicing law to, I guess, get the death penalty off there and kind of mm-hmm. spread a new way of practicing law. Absolutely. So after a few days, though, her sister just couldn't get rid of this feeling that why have I not heard back? Why is she not responding? I know she said she needed some space, but come on, you know, so whether it be a gut feeling, intuition, whatever, she, I'm sure reluctantly hits up Lauren's friends. So her friends, they go down there. They're trying to figure out, get in, knocking on the door. I imagine causing a little slight commotion, nothing crazy. And of course, Steven being upstairs, he comes down. He's just feigning All stinky. <laughs> yeah. So stinky comes downstairs and he's he's just, oh, no, w- w- what's going on? So he goes down there and probably also to give himself some more of an alibi, I'm assuming. They end up finding a key, right? That Lauren had hit somewhere. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. One of them had a spare key to get into the apartment. Something like that. Anyway, they do end up getting access to it regardless. They they end up getting in there and nothing really seems off or odd necessarily about it uh, upon first glance anyways. So the apartment's pretty clean. Nothing seems like messed up, like, you know, anything bad happened there. Well, they do find a purse and a cell phone. And this is 2011. So we are at the infancy of smartphones and things like that. But at the same time, that's also when it it's almost expected that you can reach someone at any moment. This is the end of the days of I'm not home, so you can't reach me. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Absolutely. And we're long past the days of leaving your wallet at home. Yeah, absolutely. 100 percent. So now the gut feelings even worse. Everyone's getting a little off. They just don't, it doesn't feel right. We got to bring in the big dogs. Mm -hmm. So at this point, law enforcement is contacted and law enforcement, rightfully so, is just looking at this as a missing persons case at first. They're thinking maybe she was snagged by someone or maybe, you know, hopefully she just left on a whim, you know, to get away, get a break, take a breather. Maybe she was overwhelmed. This is all things you're hoping for, including law enforcement, because you don't want to jump to conclusions like that right away. Absolutely. Yeah. This is all fresh information. We, We always look at this in retrospect after everything's gathered at the time. This is all emerging Exactly. Think how you would be looking at it if if a family member went missing. You're not going to jump to murder first thing. Yeah, this is somewhat equivalent or similar to thinking, did I leave my stove on at home? You yeah. Know? And then coming home, you know, and seeing your house burn down. That almost never happens. Most yeah. of the time, it's the last thing that happens or that we would expect to happen. You know, absolutely. At this point, law enforcement gets there. They start kind of searching, question everybody. Uh, they do kind of like an on-site questioning of everyone, just real casual. Stephen, Stephen, in matter of fact, kills it too. Uh, at this point, they're also starting to go ahead and get permission into people's apartments, which everyone is pretty accepting of that, of course, because they, they just they just want to find Lauren. Yeah, well, not Stephen. Steven's the only one. Steven's the only one. So, Steven, after voluntarily going to the police station and go ahead and give an interview, which he also kills, right? So, they he bring him down to the police station mm-hmm. after he refuses the search, right? Correct. Is this because maybe they're... I, I know that at some point they had heard that she had a weird neighbor. I believe it was the uncle was like, you know, checking on the upstairs neighbor. I heard he's kind of just off. Yeah, so they, so they took him... Just to kind of clear it up for myself, they, they, they interviewed him on site, asked him permission to see his apartment. He says no. He's the only one. Mm-hmm. Then they took him down to the police station. Mm-hmm. And then you said, how does that go? He does just fine. Uh, there's really nothing that he says to police that leads them to for sure believe that he has anything to do with it at this point. They're more so, they're just crossing their T's and dotting their I's, essentially. They, they just have to make sure they do their due diligence. Yeah. And right? then they drop him off. Mm-hmm. But what they but what Steven doesn't know is that earlier, after he had refused to search to let them search his apartment, one of the officers had found something. Yes, an officer had smelled a specific smell that it, you, yeah, death. Death has a very 
certain smell, and it's it's you can't mix it up with anything else. Death smells like death. I think they call it necrosis. Mm -hmm. That's the smell of bacteria breaking down tissues. It's a, like a combination between, I'm guessing, like feces and just like rotten meat. And gases and things like mm -hmm. that. So they do end up, you know, finding that. And on, I don't know if it's on the way back or when they get back, drop Steven back off, they kind of let him know they're, they're just, hey man, you're the only one who's saying no at this point. That's it's really weird. Let us in your apartment, man. But nobody knows about the torso, right? Correct. No one, including Steven at this point. So Steven doesn't know. And I, I, I don't believe the family knows, but I'm not hundred percent sure. It's conjecture. Um, they go into the apartment, right? They go into the apartment. He's mentioning I'm a virgin. Uh, da, da, da. I, I, I like to keep to myself. He's, he's, he's playing himself up to be the super Christian, super nice, weird nerd kind of, I guess, figure. And they find the, the stockpile of food and water, right? Yeah, and they thought that was a little odd. They also found condoms, which they thought was odd, especially considering that he mentioned multiple times that he was a virgin and saving himself for marriage, which I don't know about you. If I was doing that, I wouldn't I wouldn't really just be telling everybody. That's not just something that you tell someone you just met. Like, that sounds like something you would tell somebody to like establish a character background. I'm, I come from a very Christian household where we would never do anything out of the ordinary. Here's my box of Magnum condoms. <laughs> I'm dead, yeah. And so, rightfully so, cops are just like, ugh. So, Steven, feeling confident. He he thinks he's hidden the evidence well. He thinks he's getting away with this. Giving two good interviews. Two good interviews. Super confident. Goes out. He's like, I'm going to establish some more of an alibi. Or at least that's what I think that he's doing. And he goes, he sees the news crews out there. And he's just like, hmm, maybe I should talk to them. Now this is where we get this infamous footage, which is what makes this case so, so interesting. Would you mind pulling that up for us? I would absolutely love to pull that up for you. Let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out and... I mean, no one's heard from her since. Do you see her hang out with anyone at the time and anything like that? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, you always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer? Yeah, she and I were, we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went at, we went over, one of her friends had a key. We went inside and tried to see if there was anything a miss, but I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it, so there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. I mean, what about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of. I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body. Um, had you heard? Anything? Body. So we're gonna let the rest of the clip play here in a second, but. Let's go ahead and talk about some of this. It's clear he's kind of laying out what an they alibi. think. An alibi. He's trying to even put the crime a little bit away. Maybe she was on a run. Maybe someone snatched her, you know, and nothing seemed to miss in the apartment. It's also kind of weird he brought up that door jammer, too. He's, he's also placing himself in, in with the search party. Correct. Saying the word we a lot. He brings up that one of the friends, we answered our own question there, one of the friends had a key, mm -hmm. the apartment to go in. Like you said, he brings up the door jammer. Very important piece of evidence, and it keeps coming back up. And it's weird that he mentions that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, right here, you can kind of see in his face, too. You know he's he, his brain's racing at this point. He's, he's, he thinks he's got away with it because the trash was supposed to go out a couple hours prior. And on top of that... The media was not supposed to know about this body. Correct. The law enforcement law enforcement wanted to keep this on the DL. They did not want anybody to find out that they had found a body. But you know the media. The media is going to find a way. They're just going to do it. So 
Anyways, let's go ahead and see his reaction. Had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. That one ends right there after he takes a seat on the curb for a 90s grunge style album. Yeah, he does that. After he sits down, he actually ends up giving a second little bit of a interview style thing to the news and says something to the effect of, I wish I could have let her borrow one of my guns, defend herself. He starts getting very emotional and erratic. And so the first two interviews are, you know, this is not like those. No. Now he's giving a very poor performance. Yeah, he's starting to unravel a little bit. He's lost it. He 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 had thought he was in the clear. He thought things were were looking up for him at this point that he got away scot free essentially. And he was unaware that the body was even still on the site. Correct. So I'm actually going to bring up a picture of the trash can real quick. I wanted to. So this is outside of Lauren's apartment and Stevens. Um, this is on the corner right here, and this is a. Uh, probably the type of trash can that they found it in just wanted to kind of bring that up mm -hmm. there so yeah they they found that and steven loses it cops obviously see this news interview yeah they just let him out of his apartment correct and i mean you can tell it's suspicious it, it's weird it like everything about I mean, you can understand being worried, but it's like, man, you were just like her upstairs neighbor. You weren't like her boyfriend. It's, it's understandable to be upset, but he's dramatic. Coupled with the two refusals for search. Now things awareness. are adding up. Definitely. I agree for sure. So obviously police are like, get your weird stinky yes. self right back here. And let, let's go ahead. Let's run this. Let's let her run this interrogation back again, essentially. So we got a couple of clips. We don't have, we're not going to play the whole thing. The whole thing is about two hours long. So we're, we're not going to do that. We're, we've, we've selected a couple of clips that are really just kind of let you into the disturbing mind of Steve. And there's some takeaways from it. He maintains body position other than when he's addressed. So right here, you see his hands on the table. That's because he was addressed by the interrogating officer. Put your hands up on the table. Generally speaking, he doesn't move his body. He remains in a near catatonic state and he responds with answers. Yes, no, I don't know. Unless it's a specific, specific question. So you're saying almost like how he had talked to his roommate, his previous roommate about doing if he if he ever did murder somebody, which is very, yes. this is very suspicious. He had brought up in forums, talked to the roommate. It, they had in writing that he would use this state if he were to ever commit an act of violence, that he would use a ruse where he would pretend to be incompetent or unable, unfit, as I believe the word, to stand trial. Mm -hmm. So he could be put into a mental place as opposed to a prison. That he correct? entered a state of psychosis or mm -hmm. unawareness. And this is completely backing that up. Yeah, and this is conjecture. You know, we can't say for sure that Stephen did that, but it's it's it painted a picture for investigators. Absolutely. A lot of circumstantial evidence right there. But go ahead, we'll, we'll play a little clip right here for y'all. Any brothers or sisters? My sister lives in Tucker. Georgia? Yes. What's up with the pair of underwear that was in your apartment? That was know. like a mask. It was cut out like a mask. Do you, you cut underwear out to look like a mask? No. How many guns did you have in your apartment? So we've selected this clip because we found that a little disturbing during one of the searches of Steven's apartment they uncover panties multiple panties right they were later confirmed to be Lauren's that's not even the worst part like you just heard they had holes cut in them to wear like a mask is what they're assuming for me this ties back to uh, all the way at the beginning when we started talking we brought up that Lauren had been emailing her boyfriend, that she felt that people had been in her house and that things had been going either missing or moving around. It seems pretty clear that what was missing was the panties. That could have very well been, you know, maybe she saw several pairs of panties go missing. I know if several pairs of boxers, maybe I won't notice if one, maybe two pairs of boxers go missing, but if several pairs of my boxers go missing, I must 
start being like, what the, like, what is going on here? Yeah. So you can only imagine yeah. how Lauren's feeling. And living alone next to a weirdo mm -hmm. and your panties go missing. That's almost one of those situations Anxiety where you're, you're, you're hoping your mind isn't taking you to the correct place, but it probably is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So he, it just kind of puts you even more into his his mind on how sick he was and really twisted. I mean, you're breaking into some woman's house, grabbing her panties. And not only are you grabbing panties, you're cutting them into masks. What are you doing? Yeah, it's 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 showing that he's not. Um, He's not all there. Oh, at all, no. And couple this with the asking Lauren out, the um, just a strange demeanor. It's it's clear this this is painting a picture of obsession. This man was obsessed with Lauren mm -hmm. and believed. I think that she liked him. Yeah, I believe he was. He was mistaking her kindness for romantic gestures. gestures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing too, uh, you you can hear the tone of his voice never changes. That's part of the catatonic state feigning. Whenever you look this up, a lot of the times it'll be under the moniker, the killer that wouldn't crack or mm -hmm. because he maintains this for hours upon hours upon I hours. I believe that's also some of that law degree kicking in. He mm. knows if he's not pleading the fifth, he better keep it short, better not lock himself into any time frames, which he does avoid doing. He, he's just, nope. Yes, I don't know. For most of it, like you said, unless it was very specific, there was a moment where they asked where he got guns from. He he was willing to answer stuff like that very specifically, yeah. and that was fine. But immediately after, it would go right back to yes, no, I don't know. It's it's, it's easy to it's easy in your head to look at it when you watch it. Anything that can be answered with a yes, no, or maybe is, and Absolutely. anything that has to be answered directly is. It also um, shows that uh, Stephen gives three. Out of four, he gave one bad interview and then two good ones earlier. And in this one, I hate to say he killed it, but he does hold character the entire time. Mm. He does show that he's educated. He does show that he knows what police need in order to make a case. While he did mess up on camera, that was because of an unforeseen incident happening. They found a body. Yeah, and that's going to shoot anxiety through anybody, especially if you killed someone. Yeah, you see a man just injected essentially with the most amount of anxiety my my world is over oh my yeah walls plan, are closing in but still rebounds is brought into interrogation and then enacts the third or another part of the plan my backup plan i'll pretend to be crazy mm -hmm. upon the second search obviously they find the more disturbing stuff like the panties with the holes in it they find two keys a master key lauren's key which very alarming and we couldn't find any information on where he got it from and i don't even know if police were concerned with it at this point i think they just wanted to get steven at this point you know and not only that they find the packaging to a stanley hacksaw which if all you find is a torso that's very alarming that's leading well it's definitely adding up yeah so they don't find the hacksaw itself there uh, but however they do find a hacksaw in the maintenance shed or where you know in apartment complexes how they have a maintenance guy and he typically keeps all of his stuff tools things for part regular park or uh, apartment maintenance all in his little spot they found the hacksaw there yeah, and if you live in an apartment you know that whenever you have uh something wrong with your with your unit that you put in an order and if you're not there, they can enter your apartment to do it for you and they'll leave a completed work order. So this is conjecture, but we were talking about how we think maybe he got the master key from in there or something. We we really, I wish we could find an answer on that, but we, we could. just can't. There's, there's thoughts. And like we said, this is conjecture that possibly the maintenance guy had a key cutter because you bring up that Steven had two keys. He had mm -hmm. a master key to everyone, but specifically a key to Lauren's apartment, mm -hmm. implying that Maybe he didn't have constant access to the master key. Maybe that was the maintenance guy. Again, conjecture. But that at some point he obtained a copy of Lauren's key. Mm -hmm. So that he could have perpetual access to her house. Yeah, all super alarming and creepy. Just, and, and how personal you'd have to get with a hacksaw. So, anyways, all this circumstantial stuff is adding up. During this interview, at some point, he does admit that he had been like breaking in to apartments. Yeah, they found the master key, and 
they ask him what it's for, and he he brings up that he's been going into people's apartments. So that right there is enough to get him off the streets. They they don't have enough yet to believe it or not to get him on this murder yet. So they're using this burglary or breaking and entry type stuff to go ahead, get him locked up, get him off the streets. We know where he's at. We need him in one spot. So it's clear that Stephen did it at this point. Yeah. So now at this point, Lauren's family contacts police and you remember how I had said earlier that her, she was super against the death penalty Mm -hmm. in her honor. They asked that Stephen not be charged with the death penalty. Okay. Now, prosecution came back with a counteroffer. Essentially, they're they're like, that's cool. No worries. But all we found is a torso. We're going to need a handwritten allocution. We're going to need you to tell us what happened. What did you do? Where did you put... Where is Lauren, essentially? And... That's the trade-off. So you're saying we ended up, we knew Stephen did it, but mm-hmm. we ended up with all these circumstantial pieces of evidence, enough to, to get him to at least confess, like, hey, I did this. But they want to... We want to know. Put him we, under the jail, essentially. So. They, they want to f- piece this puzzle together, this jigsaw. Mm-hmm. And so they want him to write this allocution, a step-by-step process of what went through his head, how he did it. And we actually have access to that right now. So if you don't mind, go ahead and, and run us through... <sighs> Lauren's last moments. What what kind of happened and what how, how did this crime take place? What what led up to this? So, Stephen writes in his uh, allocution, on Sunday, June 26, 2011, around 4:30 a.m., I entered Laura Giddings' apartment with a master key I possessed. I was wearing gloves and a mask. I walked to her bedroom door and stood there observing her sleeping. As I st- as I took another step, the floor creaked and she awoke. She sat up in bed, saw me, and said very calmly, get the fuck out. I leaped across the bed onto her and grabbed her around the throat. We tumbled out of the bed to the floor, and in her struggle to get away, she moved her legs and lower body under her bed, preventing her from getting away or kicking me. I kept my hands around her throat as we fell to the floor. She reached up and was able to grab the mask and pull it off my head. She said, Stephen, please stop. I continued to strangle her until she stopped moving, and I remained that way, my hands around her throat, for several minutes, possibly as long as 15 minutes. She did not move anymore. So this is the first part of the crime. It kind of paints a little bit of a picture to like the stuff we were talking about earlier, the master key, the extra key, Lauren feeling like there was something happening in her house that she couldn't explain. Stephen was stalking her. He was obsessed, and he was breaking into her apartment possibly every night. And I think he felt offended when the door jammer was put there, too. Yeah, and in fact, I think we have some footage down this way to the left. So this is a video clip. So Stephen was used to unfettered access to Laura's apartment, mm-hmm. right? As she became more and more concerned that something was going on, she bought this door jammer. Something that we brought up earlier in the show, something that we that Stephen brings up in the interview clip. She put that door jammer there, and when he tried to break in, he got upset. Right? This is him finding it. And just put pause that real quick, just for some backstory. This was discovered a camera on a broomstick. It was a camera on a broomstick. Yeah, um, he taped up camera to the end of the broomstick, and remember, Stephen's on the upper floor, right? Mm. And so it's hard to tell from. From the video, we're going to watch it and everything. But when he tried to gain access to the apartment, he got stopped by the door jammer. Mm -hmm. So he went into his house. Made this makeshift little camera device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now he's got to go peep into her house now with a camera to figure out. He doesn't know this is a door jammer. This is when he's learning. He's learning. He's trying to figure out what's stopping him. So this is the footage. And as you can kind of see here, he's trying to peek at that front door, seeing what is exactly so watch, stopping see that, him. See those lights right there? That's a car coming. There's a street behind them. That's the street that separates them from Mercer University. Mm-hmm. As the car comes, watch what he does. You can kind of see right here. I'm guessing, I, like I said, I can't really tell. I think this is the door jammer. You can see the cars moving on the street behind him. He's peeping in. He sees it. He can tell this is what's blocking him, right? The camera kind of shifts a little bit. 
And then here in a second, he's going to kind of turn. You're going to see like the edge of the balcony. Possibly the floor grating. You can't, you can't really tell. But he, he learns that there's something blocking the doorway, right? He goes inside and he gets on the internet. And he either Googles or Reddits. Looking right at Reddit. How do you get past the door jammer? And he figures out how, right? After he gets past the door jammer, he's either angry or upset that Lauren's moving, that she's leaving. You know, she's, he's not going to have unfettered access anymore. Couple this with him being stopped by the door jammer, and now she's found him out, right? So in a heated moment of passion, he kills her. He chokes her to death and sits on top of her for 15 minutes. I dragged her into the bathroom and placed her in the bathtub, then returned to my apartment. I remained in my apartment, mostly on my computer, throughout the day, Sunday, June 26th. I returned to Lauren's apartment around midnight Sunday to begin to dismember her with a hacksaw that was later recovered from the laundry room maintenance closet. I removed her limbs and head, wrapped them in several black trash, several black trash bags separately, and discarded them in the Mercer Law School dumpster across the street from Barrister's Hall apartment. I cut up the mask, gloves, and my shirt and flushed them down my toilet. I wrapped her torso in black plastic trash bags and placed it in the green barrister's hall trash can on Tuesday, June 28th, before daylight. I then cleaned up her bathroom. I never used the refrigerator in apartment. One. It seems like there's a little bit cut off there. Like they just kind of cut out the apartment number. And I'm guessing he's talking about Lauren's apartment number. He's saying he never used her refrigerator. At no time before Lauren's death did I sexually accost her. At no point after her death did I perform any sexual act of any kind with respect to her remains. She was wearing the pink running shorts when she died and I never removed them. They were found on her torso just as I had left them. I want to pause there just for a second because he made mention that he was a virgin, yet he had condoms in the apartment. So why would he specifically mention now, this is all this your is, personal opinion. This is my personal opinion. It, it, it leads me to believe that he did do something, just from the fact that he brought it up. I wouldn't put it past him, because clearly he's dismembered someone. So that's clearly not he's, out of the realms of possibility. But again, that is all just opinionated. Um, but it is odd that he does, doesn't want to own up to something like that, but is okay with dismemberment. So that, that was very odd to specifically point that out. I would agree with you on that 100%. He also brings up that he spent an entire day between choking Lauren to death and dragging her to the bathroom to cut her into pieces. Yeah, during that day, he had said that he believed even at some points, and I don't know if he really believed this, but he did claim that he believed that she was still alive that it, it was almost a dream or that she was just at her apartment okay he was disassociating heavily that leads me to believe that part of him was under delusion and part of him wasn't that maybe his mind was split in some type of fractured way i i'm not a psychologist again this is just a thought that possibly some part of him did believe that Lauren was okay, that this didn't happen, that he erased the memory from his mind. Honestly, it could have been so traumatizing that maybe he truly did believe that. Maybe he was traumatized. Who knows? I mean, he did just kill somebody. And for all we know, this is the only person that he's killed. Yeah. And it's somebody that he's obsessed with. Given somebody obsessed with another person, they don't want them to disappear or to leave. But he knew she was going to leave. Mm -hmm. and, and some people believe that that is what spurred this moment even more because he was about to lose access to her completely, having it be the end of the month. He knew that this was the last month that she was going to be there. She was about to go ahead and do her bar. And I'm just asking, is it like he went there with the intention of killing her or was killing her something that happened out of... If you want my opinion, which who knows, I'm not in Steven's head. In my opinion, I don't think he was there to kill her. I think he was trying to get as much close time with Lauren as possible. And I think when she heard the floor creak, I think even at then, I think he was iffy on if he was going to do it because he's masked, right? So he's masked. He's probably still thinking, maybe I could just get away with this. Maybe I can knock her out. But then the mask comes off, and that's where I think he, he makes the conscious decision 
because I think he realizes at this point, yes, and I think that is exactly where he makes the decision, I need to kill her. I, I think he just didn't want... Now, do you think that led to that day of contemplation? That was his mind kind of rejecting what had happened, like destroying this thing of obsession that he'd been so after for so long? Do you think he was over killing her or do you think he was over losing his obsession? Not, not the act of killing her, but losing the object of his affection. Uh, well, it's, it's hard to say because he's so sick and twisted. I, I have no idea. I, I think he just ultimately wanted her to be his, but in no reality, in no universe is this happening. Do you think he was exacerbated in his anger from being blocked by the door jammer? That could have led to some of the passion, I believe. Do you think that led to some of the... Maybe he was... I also think that's why he strangled her for as long as he did, because 15... It was that or lack of strength, in my opinion. In my opinion. He's a wiry dude. Little, real skinny. Real, real, real tiny looking dude. I have no idea. It's, it's all very disturbing, nonetheless. It's, it, he's, he's clearly not in the right state of mind. He and he thought he could get away with it too clearly he thought that the law degree was going to cover his back he thought the catatonic state would keep him out of prison he thought he had ch checked all his boxes for all intents and purposes he goes on to write on monday i stayed home from bar prep class over the next several days i rarely slept used my computer extensively yet still attended bar class on tuesday and wednesday i joined the search party wednesday night into the early hours of thursday morning june 30th still in a dreamlike delusional state in which i believed at the time while taking part in the search that lauren was still alive and that i had not done what i had done even searching the empty law school in a delusional hope of finding lauren alive and well as i had as if i had not really killed her during the weeks leading up to my actions and the days following, as I look back on it now, I can only describe myself as divided in mind, unable to account for how I could have committed these horrible acts and at the same time also be able to carry on daily routine. It is difficult for me to explain why I killed Lauren and attempted to conceal my deed the way I did. The difficulty, the difficulty in explaining it lies in my own inability to understand it myself. I know that it was very wrong. I am not delusional or without all morals or decency. Yet I acknowledge that something in my makeup, my psychology, my neuropathy, my own particular pathology, perhaps, must explain it. But it is beyond my reach. Lauren was my friend. Not a day goes by that I do not grieve over her death. I am extremely sorry for what I did to Lauren and her family. I do not expect the forgiveness of Lauren's family and there is no way I can ever deserve it. No words are sufficient to take away their pain. If I could take back what happened, I would do so. If I could restore Lauren to her family, I would. All I can say to Lauren's family and her many friends is I am very sorry. Yeah, sorry doesn't bring people back though, unfortunately. So he's just going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. In April of 2014, he pleaded guilty to the murder of Lauren Giddings. And... He'll be eligible for parole in 2041, which we don't think he'll get at all, by the way. Let me let me say one more thing before we get into that, because that's a whole different can of worms right there. He's currently being held in Valdosta Prison, located in Georgia. And we have a picture if you want to see Stephen's humble abode. Right here is where Stephen McDaniel will be spending the rest of his miserable, useless life. Right there, as you see, he's in a gated community. In a gated community. And he community. gets to enjoy that for the rest of his life. They got security. Mm -hmm. Make sure that uh, they can't hurt anybody ever again. Yeah, so the parole thing, mm. right? 2041. He's not going to get that for many reasons. A, what he did here, sick. Detectives found some very disturbing things on a stick drive right some, some some things that he was able to they described it as some of the worst cp that they had ever seen seven counts seven counts which means there was an account for every time that they got a warrant for it mm. so not only was steven a murderer and sick he he was just the absolute Worst kind of person on top of all that. As if we're murdering someone doesn't make you a horrible enough person, he was even worse than we imagined. If you thought this shitty banana split didn't have a cherry, it does. It gets worse and worse and worse. 
So, rightfully so, that's Steven's new housing for the rest of his life. And I'm I'm pretty happy about it. And I, I honestly think that he should have to spend the rest of his life behind bars. I agree, man. And rest in peace, Lauren. Um, I'm glad they found him. I'm glad they put him away. I find it horribly, horribly tragic that, you know, she died the way that she did when her goal was to help people like him not have to suffer. I mean, she even helped him once more after her death. That's the thing, yeah. It's, it know? really goes all the way back, man, to just who she was as a person. Even in death, man, she kept this man from dying. Absolutely. So, you know, we just like to end this episode, you know, in memory of Lauren Giddings and just, you know, this is Tombstone Tourist. Appreciate y'all watching the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and best of all, share it with a friend. That's right. We got your weekly needs for crime, horror, and paranormal. I'm Pickled Landon. And I'm Rugburn. And this is Tombstone Tourist. <laughs>